everyone around you is a mammal. Problem is that once you get it, when you see something in the future, in the distance, that you think will be good for you, you get excited, you take action, and once you get it, the dopamine stops. You want to say that it's more natural for individuals to seek the happiness than the success. Unhappiness is very common whether it's a successful person or an unsuccessful person. Hi everyone, uh, Radislav Gandapas here and this is my channel Leadership Strategies. Uh, our guests are uh, successful people and thinkers uh, who share their expertise in a uh, field of leadership. Today's guest is the author of numerous books, including the bestseller Habits of Happy Brain, Californian University professor and founder of the Inner Mammal Institute, Dr. Loretta Graziano Broning. Hello, Loretta. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, the Institute of Inner Mammal. It uh, sound, sounds great, uh, unusual, and uh, even funny in good sense. <laughs> what do you do there? What, what do you work with? So I create resources and provide them to people all over the world, mostly for free, um, to help people understand their inner mammal, which is the brain structures we've inherited from earlier mammals that control the chemistry that makes us feel good and bad. Okay, yes. my, uh, my channel is called Leadership Strategies. Strategies. How related to, to horm hormones, yeah. So, um, everyone around you is a mammal. H how and when you under mm -hmm. understand your own mammal brain and the mammal brain in other people, then it's easier to lead them. And in fact, um, monkeys are very competitive. They're always trying to get the position of strength away from the other monkey. And when you understand this, it helps you feel more relaxed about what's going on around you because you see that it's natural. My main topic is uh, leadership and yours, happiness. What is the link between them? And then it was discovered that a chemical called serotonin is released when an animal feels that it's in the position of prominence. And this is not the way most people talk about serotonin today. So in recent years, the psychology field has tried to ignore this um, pleasure that animals take in competition. Um, and there's some reason because too much of it can, as I said, have harmful consequences and everyone can see that. Um, but it's important to be honest with yourself. Otherwise, when you lose that position of dominance, your mammal brain tells you that it's a survival threat, but it's not. The simple example is, let's say a person wins the Olympics, and then after they win, they start feeling down because they already achieved their goal then they feel like they have to win the Olympics again. So this is crazy. And we need to understand that this is coming from our mammal brain so we can refocus it. Uh, as a coach, I teach successful people and uh, I can say that many of them are not successful, not, uh, not happy. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, being unhappy uh, is prerequisite to the achievement of success? Unhappiness is very common whether it's a successful person or an unsuccessful person. And that's why I think happiness is the most important goal, more important than what you would call success. So the way my books explain it, so there's dopamine happiness, oxytocin happiness, and serotonin happiness. And we want all of them. And when we understand what causes them, then we can take steps that get them. And success, you could say, is one kind of step, but then you're limiting yourself from other, t other parts of life that can make you happy, but don't make you successful. You want to say that it's more natural for individuals uh, to seek the happiness than the success. What's natural is to seek whatever rewarded you when you were young. So every brain has its own theory of, of happiness. 
And if a person decided when they were young that success is the way to happiness, then that's the only way they seek. Another person may think alcohol is the way to happiness. Another person may think um, following your friends is happiness, and then they are always following and never leading. So we limit ourselves because our brains are wired when we're young. Our brains are wired by anything that triggers our reward chemicals when we're young. And the challenge is to build new pathways to get rewards in new ways. And the problem is that once you get it, when you see something in the future, in the distance that you think will be good for you, you get excited, you take action, and once you get it, the dopamine stops. And then you have to find a new reward in order to get that good feeling of dopamine. I always use a simple example. If, if I check my numbers of how many books do I sell or how many likes do I sell, then uh, how many likes do I have? Then one minute it will be up, one minute it will be down. Every time it's up, then it's harder for me to get more of that number. So if I let my happiness depend on that number, then I would be unhappy a lot of the time. And I don't want to be unhappy a lot of the time. So I look for a way to define happiness that I can control. So I look for a goal that I can control. And I say to myself, I can't control who buys my book, but I can control the pleasure of writing something new, creating something new. Okay, so I'm always focused on what new thing can I create? And the equivalent in, um, in the management world would be to feel the pleasure of creating something that you believe in. And if it's not appreciated in your current environment, that you can believe that you will get appreciation for it somewhere else. And by the way, uh, Hollywood star Shia LaBeouf once said, what's to, to the effect of my terrible childhood was a blessing. I know many people who would say something similar. What is your opinion connected with? with well, the, with this the is the irony. This is the irony because when you have information on people, you often find that people who achieve something had a bad childhood and yet what yeah. do they do when they have children? They try to make their children's life easy, right? And so yes. we all try to make the life of our children easy, even though it doesn't work. No one wants to be cruel to their child. And also when people are not having the success that they want, they assume that it's unfair because other people had an easier life, right? Everybody assumes someone else has a, had a better life and that's why they're more successful. So this is the comparing. The animal brain is always comparing because animals avoid getting into a fight when they risk losing. So they're always comparing their strength to the strength of others. And we have inherited a brain that is constantly comparing our strength to others and make you unhappy unless you're honest about it. And then you can say, I don't want to be unhappy. So I have to feel positive about my own strength instead of focusing on the strength of others. As a specialist uh, in the uh, in field of public speaking, I'm very often asked the question, uh, you know, how can I overcome uh, my fear of uh, speaking pu uh, publicly? How would sure. you answer the question? Sure. So fear is a chemical called cortisol. Most people have heard that this is called the stress chemical, but that in the animal world, this is the chemical that tells you that your survival is in danger and you are about to be eaten by an animal. So in the animal world, when you're socially isolated and alone, that's when a predator will eat you. So in the human world, we feel that if we have social rejection, it creates the feeling 
that you're about to be eaten by an animal. So people create fear by imagining social rejection. And you have to become aware that that's what you are imagining. And then you have to change that um, expectation. But your new expectation needs to be realistic. If you say the whole world loves me, then you're not going to believe it. Is it important to, to show how much you love kids to for uh, to make them more happy and more, more successful in their um, their life. So most people mm -hmm. want to give their child what they did not have, and that's good. But if you only give them what you did not have, and you forget to give them other things, so that's the trouble. So if a person grew up without attention and Maybe they give their child a lot of attention, but they don't give them other things. So what are the other things? Simple word would be structure, but what I call it is realistic expectations. That means that if a child does something bad and you still give them a hug and a cookie, then they expect that they can do bad things and the world will still love them. So that's that's harmful. So we need to give our children realistic expectations about the world. Uh, Andrew Tarkovsky, Russian filmmaker and uh, international filmmaker uh, as well. Uh, he often used to say, humans are not made for happiness because there are certain things that are more important than happiness. He's already died, but uh, what, uh, what would you respond to him be? When I hear people say that certain things are more important for happiness, I believe that they are really saying that because that makes them happy. So the simple example is uh, the, cha <laughs> the chemical that we did not talk about yet, oxytocin. So oxytocin is the chemical of acceptance and belonging. It's social trust and it's what rewards animals for staying with a herd in order to have protection of a group. Now, when you're young, it's when you're a teenager, um, you want to have a group and you want to have a powerful group because that's what monkeys do. And you want to have a group of your peers instead of just your family. And it's hard to create that. So it feels very dangerous. And research on monkeys shows it's the same thing. When a monkey leaves home, they're very scared and they try to create a new group. Now, how do you create a new group? Whatever worked for you, the rest of your life, you are wired to say, this is the important thing in life. And you think it's important because when that created a group in your adolescence, that told your inner mammal that you are safe and in the animal world, a group helps you get mating opportunity. And so that's obviously an important goal. Uh, you, you already told it, uh, happiness is much more important than, than success. But if somebody wants to combine happiness and success. Yes, I want oxytocin, which is social trust. I want serotonin, which is pride. And I want to avoid cortisol, that's the most important. And what turns on all these chemicals for me is my old pathways. So I want new pathways to turn them on in new ways instead of just repeating the same behaviors my whole life. And so I can only decide about that in the next minute and then choose each step toward which chemical do I need now how to create this new new way new roads new so new roads simple roads yes <laughs> uh, the simple answer is repetition and that's complicated because you don't want to repeat something unless it feels good but it won't feel good unless you have a new road so that's what makes it complicated so you make a decision you say i have decided that in order to be happy I need to do more of X and less of Y. And so I promise myself that every day 
I'm going to spend five minutes or even one minute to do this new thing. And that will create the new road in my brain. And then that will start to feel natural and normal to me. Are there examples in your life or your client's life or student's life or leaders you, you've written about? Yes, yes, yes. I'll give you two examples. Um, first, when I was young, I was trying to be successful, as you can understand, and I was not wasting time. You know, you would call it wasting time. Mm -hmm. But I realized, like I said, like the famous um, movie person that you mentioned, that I was really saying that for a different reason, because when I was young, I had bad experiences with people, like all people I had bad experiences with. So I was really <laughs> trying to be successful to avoid people. So I had to force myself to spend more time with people, even though it feels like wasting time. And it was more like an anthropologist to be with people for five minutes and listen to them, don't agree, um, just to learn about people. And when I said that I'm learning about people, then it felt like at least I was doing something useful for me, even if I didn't agree with the people. And so by doing that, it started to feel more natural and less dangerous. So that's one example. But another example that I think is very important right now, many people are watching the news too much and they're giving themselves too much fear. So I had to really train myself not to watch the news. And um, every time I would turn on something other than the news and to appreciate when you are away from something bad. Which skills uh, have we develop? When I feel threatened to know that this is something I created instead of thinking that it's real threat in the world. Okay. So many people, when they have a bad feeling, what does an animal do when it has a bad feeling? So first it looks like if I smell a lion, I look for a lion. So people are always looking for lions and then they feel bad and more cortisol and more cortisol, and more stress. So it's understanding that I created the feeling myself and to say, why did my cortisol turn on? The, the majority seek happiness via love. Instead, they typically find suffering. Why is that? Or in what the main mistake? Romantic love turns on all of our happy chemicals at the same time, including a fourth one that I haven't talked about. So romantic love feels so important because it stimulates all your happy chemicals at once. And that tells you nothing in the world is more important. And the reason is that in the animal world, the only thing matters is reproduction. And this is not consciously, animals don't think in words, I want to reproduce and spread my genes all over the forest, but natural selection built a brain that gives you happy chemicals when you do something relevant to reproduction. And love is very relevant to reproduction, even if you're not trying to have children, um, the chemicals are controlled by those expectations. And that's why they get your attention more than anything else. And then, why does this go down? Because dopamine, when you get what you want, the dopamine stops and it takes something new to trigger more dopamine. And I am not saying this to suggest that a person should have a new partner all the time because that has many harmful effects. But I'm suggesting that we have to understand our own dopamine so that we don't ruin the relationship we have. The new level, the, the new period of relationship can, can give uh, a little more dopamine in, the, uh, in our blood. Yes, and well? uh, yes. So the first thing is not to blame your partner for failing to give you dopamine. Most people think, 
-hmm. I need excitement. It's my partner's fault that I don't feel excitement. And that's not true. We're all responsible for having our own goals to give ourselves dopamine. But it's important to remember that dopamine is not the only happy chemical. So we also need oxytocin from social trust. So if I have a partner that I can trust, I should be grateful every day that I can trust this person. And if I cannot trust them, I need to make that a goal to discuss with them and to increase trust because your inner mammal only feels safe when you can trust. And finally, serotonin is pride. So many people, their partner, and if you're not proud of yourself, you may blame your partner for your bad feelings. So again, we're responsible for having pride in ourselves, but we can also find a way to include our partner in our pride. Great. What, what is the fourth uh, dopamine uh, we, uh, we didn't talk about? Endorphin. And endorphin is very famous because of runner's high that people get it when they run. And it's also famous because it was the first one to be studied. And endorphin is the same as opioid or heroin or morphine. The word came from morphine. And in animals, you only get it when you're injured, when you have physical pain and you're hurt. And endorphin covers the pain with a good feeling, which is why we like it, but which is why we should not be chasing it all the time because you have to create pain in order to enjoy it. Greta, you reminded me about, about the relationship between boss and um, employee. Uh, when employee starts uh, working for, for the boss in a new place, new company, uh, He's happy with new relationship, with new opportunities, uh, and, and so on, many things. And he's happy, happy, happy. And so when I have a new job, I expect everything's going to be different. But the minute I have a real interaction with real people, it triggers my old circuits. So then I think it's the same old thing. So part of the problem is my old circuit, but part of the problem is my unrealistic expectations. I think everything is going to be great in the new place. And part of that is this modern culture of thinking that you need to be a superstar. And of course, it's natural to want to be a superstar. Every monkey wants to be a superstar. So we have to find the middle. And the way to do that, I always suggest, is to only focus on your next step and to say, if I can take one step toward my goal, I can feel good about that. And then I will take one more step toward my goal. And if my boss is not um, helping me to reach my goal, I don't have to see that as a problem because I can believe that there are many ways to reach my goal. And no matter what my boss does, I will find a way to reach my goals anyway. Realistic, 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 and so on. What about dreaming? Is, is dreaming useful in this case? I, instead of dreaming one big dream, I tell people to have three goals, a long run goal, a short run goal, and a middle term goal, so that I can always be making progress, even when I'm not doing this grand super thing. People say, don't crush our, our, our dreams. Dream, to, dreaming is good. This is the uh, skill we uh, f forgot. Don't crush it, but let, let them alive. Let my, our, my dreams. When we're dreaming, we are young. We're still young. And I can say it's not adult thing to dream. The adult thing is to, to, have, to, to make goals and to achieve them. The majority seek happiness via large sums of money. Uh, instead, they typically find suffering. <laughs> what's that and what's the main mistake? So if you think of a squirrel that um, wants to have enough nuts for the winter, so animals um, want to collect those nuts so that in the future, if you have a bad time, 
that you feel like you are safe. Mm -hmm. So it's the fear of the bad time in the future that's motivating you. And as long as you're always fearing that bad time in the future, then no amount of money can make you happy because you still have that fear of the bad future. Now, it's hard to change that because we all know that we will die somewhat someday. The only solution is to give yourself new things to look forward to. And more money is not really something new. So if a person is always trying to beat the competition and get more money, it's not new anymore. So they need to give themselves something new. How uh, how bo how boss can uh, can construct this uh, this safe environment in his company? I would say at fifty percent. On the one hand, it's important for a boss to create an environment where it's possible to try something new and not get attacked by others. Although humans always attack others and always try to compete but the boss has to set the example. So if the boss is criticizing and belittling and teasing people who fail or people who um, uh, are not having a big return, then others will do that. So the boss has to set a good example. But I say 50% because Many people are learning today to blame the culture of the company. If I have fear, it's the company's fault for creating a bad culture. And this is not a good habit. All of your employees are wired by their past experience. So if they blame their past experience on the company, they are not taking responsibility for managing their own brain. This is the fact that among successful people, there are many more men than women. Why do you think so? I think that there's many ways to be happy. And I think women have been open to more different ways to be happy. And maybe men have focused more on one way, whatever the one way each man chooses. And that makes sense because if you know that our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. So a man is a hunter and a woman is a gatherer. And when you're a gatherer, you're looking for every opportunity to get a reward. Where when you're a hunter, you focus on one reward. However, then there's another whole separate issue that women, if they want to have children, they have to do it by 40, whereas men, they can take their time. And uh, why do we, after a while, uh, often remember the most difficult uh, times uh, of our lives uh, yes, as the yes. happiest? We are constantly um, anticipating things that might go wrong and turning on the bad feelings in advance to protect ourselves. Now, why does this feel good? Because if you expect something bad and then you relieve the bad feeling, you feel great. So imagine a lion is chasing you and you escape from the lion. That feels great. Have leader make the, 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 uh, the periods of the danger periods in, in his company to something faster, to, to achieve the huge goal in a short period of time. Let's do that, guys. Don't sleep, don't eat, just go, just run to the, to the goal. I do not think this idea of um, don't eat, don't sleep, just run to the goal. I think people should be allowed to have a private life, that they will be healthier in the long run if they have a healthy private life. If they are only working, then a lot of tension builds up and people will look for fast ways to relieve the tension, which often they will do risky things and the risk will hurt their judgment in the long run. However, there's a better way. Um, so the simple example in, in the animal world, they look for um, a common enemy. 
when animals have a lion come, they all stick together. When the lion goes away, they spread out. So what most companies and what most humans do is they talk about a common enemy all the time. Because when there's a common enemy, then you stick together. So by another company, then you stick together. When there's no threat and everything's great, then the people within your team will fight with each other. And that's why people always talk about an enemy. And uh, vice versa, why, um, why do some use drugs or even commit suicide at the peak of success? We see many examples of it. You remember uh, the hero of uh, Jack London and, uh, and now many rock stars, um, right, um, and, uh, businessmen and others who are young, yeah. successful yeah. and rich. Why they do so? So in their brain, they're still experiencing the bad of when they were young in their past. They're reliving that over and over. And they told themselves, if I can be successful, then I will relieve this bad feeling. But being successful does not relieve the bad feeling. It's being honest with yourself about the early cause of the bad feeling that gives you the opportunity to relieve it because when you're young you're powerless and you're still replaying that threat as if you're a powerless child and you need to update the circuit and feel your own power but success does not do it when you're chasing success you're still replaying as if you're threatened so i'll, I'll give you a simple example um so, and the word for this is distraction. So when I was young, my mother was very unhappy and she expressed her unhappiness a lot in a loud voice. So imagine like I'm a little kid and I'm hearing this big person very angry all the time. What did I do when I was young? I would read books. And while I'm reading a book, I'm able to block out block out the sound of my mother's unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So then I would just spend the rest of my life with books and not do anything else thinking that that works. But the minute I put the book down, that circuit is still there. So distraction from your early pain does not work. And you just keep chasing, repeating the same rush in whatever way, whether you distract yourself with a substance or a goal or often both of them, because you need the substance to relax from chasing the goal. So I had to be honest with myself that I was still replaying my fear of my mother's anger in my head and to know that it was a circuit it was a real circuit with a real chemical, but it was not a real threat. Modern children can't walk out because they use cell phones, smartphones to read and to play. They can't block out because they need two hands to use the Yeah, but they're smartphone. using their brain. The way I was holding my book, they're blocking out the feelings. Young people are very competitive with each other and they're not being honest with themselves about that competitiveness. So here's the important thing. When many people have read about chimpanzees, if a chimpanzee is at the bottom of the ladder, they will not, if a boy chimpanzee is at the bottom of the ladder, the girl chimpanzee will not look at them, okay? So if the girl doesn't look at them, then their genes will die and that feels like a survival threat. So people have survival threat feelings when the girl looks at someone else rather than them. And you know that our ancestors had a very bad life. And for our children, if the worst thing that happens to you is that a girl looks at someone else and you act like that's the worst thing that's ever happened because it's the worst thing that happened to you and your brain fools you, it releases the cortisol, and you act like it's this horrible thing. 
So they need to read history and they need to be honest about their own. Finally, you, you know, many of those who read your books uh, send questions uh, to Instagram. Uh, Dr. Yeah. already choose her favorite three in the list of more than 100 questions. We will award prizes to those that she choose as winners. And the main prize will be your answer to the question, to that oh, three question. Good, good. <laughs> and after that, we will send books to winners because they are good readers. They've written, they've written your book and they have after questions to you, additional, and uh, they will choose mo more books to their library. So the first question, which one is, do you believe that a central factor behind people suffer from cancer is stress, bitterness, and other such negative mindsets? Is it fair to suggest that a person living in harmony or with happiness evoking hormon, uh, hormones in order shouldn't suffer from cancer? More than any other country, so thank you, Russia. And also, I want to say that um, I went to Moscow two years ago and I got such great questions. And these questions, these questions were so good. So I really, really appreciate. Um, I feel like there's a great degree of honesty. So the simple question is, does stress cause disease? And the other side of that would be to say, if you could be happy every minute, then would you protect yourself from disease? So I think it's not, the answer is not completely known. And first I should say not just disease, but pain. We're studying more about pain and people are in a pain cycle because of stress. Many people are, have said that chasing happiness is not always good for you. And if you chase happiness and then you think, I have to be happy every minute, otherwise I'll get cancer, then that's obviously worse for you. So if people think that stress will cause disease and then they think my boss is giving me stress, therefore my boss is making me sick. This is a powerless way to think. And the powerlessness is what's causing the stress. So, or, you know, people say my family is making me stressed and that will give me cancer. As long as you think of yourself as powerless, that's what's hurting you and hurting your body. So the important thing, if you don't like the way you're interacting with someone, change the rules, negotiate new rules. Don't see yourself as powerless and that will relieve more stress and be good for your body. Second question is, uh, we all observe uh, the pure and absolute joy in a happy child. Uh, is it really the case that, uh, that as adults we can never enjoy the equivalent? If so, is this the result of mature happiness so, being uh, more multifaced? The person who asked the question is making the assumption that children are happy and then we lose that. Um, and I think it varies widely. Many children are not happy. So let's just arbitrarily say if 50% of people are happy as children and 50% are not happy, and then people go around assuming that the whole world is like the way they are, you know? So I think it's more useful to say that if you were happy as a child, you are looking around for the same kind of happiness you had as a child, but you could open yourself up to more other ways to be happy and if you're unhappy as a child happiness open yourself up to more ways but the person who thinks that children are happy and adulthood is harder the important thing is that children don't really understand death and death is what helps us understand that our time is limited and when you're a teenager is around when you start understanding that and that gives um, a certain pressure, like you always feel like time is running out. And then you have responsibility for others, you have understanding of consequences. And some people, when they were children, they were protected from that. 
they didn't have to worry about consequences or the future. And that was a shock for them to, to take responsibility. Um, if that's the case for you, you can try to see what is the good side of being responsible instead of being protected, that I get more freedom, that I get more choice, and not to see it as a sad thing. And the last question from your readers uh, in this contest, uh, how is your happiness as an author influenced by the success of your books? So as an author, first, I'm still a mammal and I'm still the person I was when I was young. So I've, I've mentioned this a little bit. So um, I would still worry that if this many people buy the book today, that they won't buy it tomorrow. And so I don't focus on that because I can't control it. So I always focus on what I can control. Um, and yet when people write me letters, I'm so happy and I'm so, it's so great to get that feedback um, that people have enjoyed it and it has helped them, but I can't control it. So sometimes I go to my email and I get a great letter and then other times I go to my email and I just get nothing or something bad. So it's um, learning that I can have something really nice some of the time, but I can't control it. And just to be grateful that, um, and also to focus on what I have control over, which is writing the next book. I'm trying not to repeat myself endlessly. I'm focusing now on making another video series so that it's not just another book. It will be the last question from my side. Mm. Uh, I know it's a really common question to authors. What will be your next book about? Well, um, I, I have a book called Status Games, Why We Play and How to Stop. So um, Status Games, Why We Play and how, we, how to Stop. So this is about competition and that feeling of competitiveness and how to relax it. And I was lucky to get a contract for this book um, in December, January. And um, then my publishing company has been closed for two months and I haven't heard from them yet. I worked on the book a lot. And so it's mostly finished. And so um, one way or another, it will be out next year. Thank you, Loretta, for your interview, for your books. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for helping so many leaders around the world. <music>